and a brief background about uh, javascript and friends uh, you all would know uh, we just conducted uh, javascript and friends conference in august uh, that was our first uh, inaugural uh, conference uh, and we thank the community for uh, attending the conference and uh, making it uh, uh, a good one uh, for our first year and uh, as part of javascript and friends we currently have uh, various programs uh, we are uh, doing Vue.js Columbus Meetup Group, uh, which is basically conducted at uh, Improving Columbus Office. And we are also starting uh, a variety of other meetups like uh, Angular Online Remote Meetup. And we, all, we are also kick-starting uh, with uh, Daniel, our first React.js online meetup today. And if you are interested uh, in any other uh, meetups or workshops, uh, which needs to be conducted by us. Uh, you can always uh, reach out to us and let us know. Uh, we would like all our programs to be like uh, beginner friendly as well as uh, experienced professionals friendly. Uh, feel free to reach out to us and let us know if you want uh, any kind of workshops or uh, meetups that needs to be organized. And you can also help us uh, by volunteering. Uh, if you are interested, you can. Uh, uh, help us uh, organize or uh, lead a workshop a study group or meetup and uh, if you are interested you can also help us by supporting our uh, uh, events uh, you can reach out to us on linkedin slack or website or you can subscribe to our mailing list uh, with that said i am giving over to daniel and daniel it's all yours thank you very much all right, Bosker, if you kindly allow me to share my screen, I'd be very appreciative. Sure. Good That's evening, tough. everyone. I am Daniel Scheifler of Improving, as Bosker kindly introduced me. Just a moment while I get my screen sharing running. There we go. And let's set that. There we are. Fine. There we go. All right. So uh, this is the Web UI testing Yes, You Can by, of course, myself. And the plan for the evening is that I'm going to go over a brief overview of who I am and how I kind of came into testing for JavaScript and React and Redux in particular, as well as covering some of the basics for why exactly do we do our tests and how you can progress from not knowing how to test to actually testing much better. Throughout the presentation, it is my intent to pause to leave you guys some time to ask any questions that you have, since this is a remote presentation. I'm going to ask that you file those through Bosker, and at those pauses, Bosker, if you'd be so kind as to let me know if we have any questions, I'll be sure to pause and ask. So with that said, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and get us started. So I am Daniel Schweifler. I'm a Christian, a husband, father, all in order of occurrence, as well as most recently an improver. I'd like to fancy myself a man-machine translator, Really, that is just the way I choose to think about my job to help keep me from falling to some of the common patterns that I've seen. Mm. <clears throat> when, that, when we write code, we don't write it for the computer, although we definitely need to tell the computer the steps to do it. We often write code to solve some kind of a problem. Generally, it's a computer problem that the business wants the computer to solve. So therefore, I'm translating from a man someone in the business to the computer what they need it to do. So this actually goes back the other way, ensuring that the computer whose limitations I am familiar with, I can communicate back to the business. And it was from this communication aspect that I ended up falling in love with testing. Now, when I say fall in love, that might be a little bit more emotional a term than it really should have been. But I found that testing allowed me better to communicate the why the code was written, that the code itself couldn't share, which of course gets very close to why <laughs> My first point, why exactly do we unit test? Well, to be completely honest, the most useful thing we have for unit testing is that it codifies our expectations and our hopes and our dreams that the code we wrote would accomplish. We wrote the code for a reason, often a business reason, that can get forgotten. How many of you have had a, uh, a piece of code you wrote three months ago, come back and the scenario is no longer valid because the business changed. Um, anyone who wants to post a, an example of that in the chat, I would be most happy to elaborate on. After codifying 
why we do the test, why we capture all of that information written. One of the things I've noticed is that different testing styles will help us more in this regard. If the testing is to capture why we wrote the code, how we write the test then becomes very important. Some tests are thoroughly obtuse and very difficult to understand why the code that the test is supposed to evaluate was written in the first place. With that in mind, it's often very prudent to look at not just writing down what the test case was, but writing down the scenarios that make the test case make sense. Instead of just writing, it should do the thing, given a set of circumstances, when we attempt to do some action, then we should attempt to do the thing, would be a much more elaborated way to explain why exactly the code under test was written. So to jump in a little bit, I'm gonna show you a quick little code snippet here. And I apologize, apparently it's a little longer, but I'm gonna read the English of this. If stuff is the same as things, or the array has a length greater than two and this flag, but not the other one, then do the same. I've seen code actually look like this. I'm hoping this is not an uncommon example where people have gone through and written something and then, you know, stuff and things, which made sense it on its own because it actually had meaning, suddenly gets expanded to also contain this other case, which generally makes our lives confusing because it's not explained why the other case exists. So it is my hope that by the end of this talk, I will be able to show you how testing can help us to improve thoroughly uncommunicative code like this. Getting down to the value of testing as a rehash, one, it captures and codifies why the code that we're testing was written. It highlights places in the code organization or architecture that could because trying to test our example right here is painful. I need to control stuff, things, the array, this flag, and the other flag, and then know all of the communication and combinations thereof in order to get it right, which can tend to make things very confusing. Again, by the end of the night, I hope to show you a pattern that would allow you to refactor this to be much more readable and therefore more maintainable. One other value that testing provides is that it provides us a means to involve the business in the code. Now, that may not be apparent just from the outset, but if you think about coding or testing instead of being writing code that tests code and instead capturing why code was written, you can actually do a goodly portion of that in English. And in fact, that's where we gain a lot of this value that the business can interact with us in writing that test code not literally by having your PO sit down and hash out a test, but instead by having your PO sit down with you and explain the business use cases and helping you to break them down in certain scenarios. Our job as coders or as developers is to see how the code and the machine need to operate together and to ask questions that the business may not have fleshed out in the user story. And as a result, as we are going through writing these tests, it indicates to us questions we ought to ask the business to make certain that our code performs exactly as the business requires. And of course, as kind of a natural output of this, it verifies that the code actually works, which is the most common value of these testing. Now, I do wish to take a moment to pause and ask if anyone has any questions or would like me to elaborate on any of the why for testing. So I hear that generally we are ready to keep going, and so I shall. I thank you all for your patience. So now getting down to brass tacks, I want to actually show you the point of comparison. Now, this is a general question. How familiar is the group with unit testing? Have you all done it before? Have you had enough years, say to speak, under your belt of having done it yourself? Or are you more along the lines of, I've heard of it, but I haven't done it, or perhaps you're skeptical of the value? Uh, if you would kindly post that into the chat, I would be very appreciative. All right. Let's see, done unit testing for about three years. Very good. All right. If you guys would care to elaborate, have you been doing a, a range of active cert style unit testing or have you been trying something else? 
by the way, thank you, Josh and Kyle, both for elaborating. And so, Neil, you say you have experience with unit testing, but not with web UIs, I imagine is what you meant? Or with uh, websites, perhaps? Yes, I think that actually might be an excellent idea, Bosker. Okay. So it sounds like we have a reasonable mix of experience in the group for unit testing. So I will go ahead and show a couple of examples, which oops, wrong spot. Mm -hmm. There we are. So I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of a C-sharp code base that I was working on relatively recently. Basically, inside of this merchandising service, we had certain rules run against various types of products to determine whether or not to show, whether or not to interact with certain other options under the product. And generally, we were trying to prove that, hey, when certain scenarios happen under this rule, you report that you don't have anything matching and therefore don't interact. There we go. So this is what the tests originally looked like. Can y'all identify the line number where the when statement is or the, the action statement? Also, if anyone has any trouble reading this example, please feel free to post to the group chat and I will adjust from my dark scale background to my light scale background. Hi, this is uh, Kyle. Um, were you saying like where you're actually like making your expectation? Like so not so much for the, uh, the assertion, which would be the expectation, but where the action step, the thing that I am actually testing in all of this test file or method is. So for the method, no scenario matches, what line commits the action that I'm actually testing? Oh, it's be like a uh, 42. Mm -hmm. You and Josh both seem to have identified it quite right. Evaluator giving a matching scenario for a given test product. Now, about 80% of this method is all contained from lines 41 to 25, and all of that is for the range, right? So for those unfamiliar, there is an example. Hold on, let me go ahead and jump back to my presentation. There we go. So ever heard of AAA, which actually stands for Arrange, Act, Assert. It's a very common, very easy to remember testing framework. You start with setting up your code to test whatever it happens to need, which in our example case would be lines 25 through 41, which all do a lot of this mock repository, generate stub or build an example and generally set up the pieces, like my scenario rule evaluator, the thing I'm actually testing for the test with all of the mocks. I mean, even I'm creating a test product at this point. And all of these are what would be considered the first A in AAA, which is to arrange. I have arranged the scenario so that I may test. But does anyone upon reading know why, for example, the Rule evaluator needs to have a query and executor a builder, for example. The scenarios query at least seems reasonable for this test, but the rest is not very explanatory why you would need those, right? And so that is one of the weaknesses of the AAA style. Even though it can be extremely easy to remember, it ends up being like training wheels on a dirt bike. It's a great place to get started, and heck, it's a heck of a lot better than having none when you're first going but there are genuinely better ways to do it. Now, of course, there is an easy chance to say, well, that's just what it looks like in C-sharp because those guys just hammer out code. Okay, fair. Let's take a look at an example from, wow, goodness, I did not anticipate that being that small. This is actually for a React component called the item actions bar. And its job is essentially to render up a series of subcomponents that dispatch a Redux event 
to produce certain behaviors interacting with the data shown on the UI. It has a little bit, behavior, little bit of behavior that we're actually trying to validate in that it will show or hide certain of those actions given scenarios inside of the app. And so what we end up with is single test cases like if no product is selected and the container contains only one item, then should not render. And I have my results is equal to a shallow render of item actions bar with these properties of which I'm not really certain which one associates with product sele not selected or container contains only one item. And then I expect the result type to be null. Now I'm gonna slow down here real quick. How many of you have had experience doing UI testing for React components? Now this would be an excellent time to unmute and chat if you would like. Okay, so Josh has done this in a classroom type setting. It looks like Kyle has done the React UI testing for about a year. Okay, so Kyle, if you'd be so kind, would you uh, unmute and I would love to chat with you for a second. Sure, yeah. So would you say that shallow is, I'm sorry, you're familiar with shallow then with Enzyme, yeah? Yes. And you know then the difference between shallow and mount, yeah? Yes. Cool. Would you share then with the group the difference between shallow and mount? So when you shallow render a component, it will mount the component actually, well, it, mount. it will go through the component's life cycle of component did mount, uh, I believe like component did update, but it doesn't build and render its child components. Whereas mount will actually build the component and its child, child, child components and child components and child components. Like, mm -hmm. And so it will go and navigate through the entire stack of everything you're dealing with. So shallow ends up being, to be completely honest, one of my preferred ways to establish a unit test for an individual uh, component, especially when what I'm really interested in is did you or did you not show child component? Because what shallow will do instead of going all the way through the child components is that it will leave the tag for say the delete item component and it will just, print that text, but it won't go through and find the delete item component and navigate all the way through its own div. And so what it allows is that I can say in the result, which will be the HTML exported by the render function of item actions bar, I can find then the text corresponding to the tags of delete item. So when I shallow mount, this is actually the easiest way to go through it. If I did a full mount, I then will often have to go and navigate to find particular divs or particular styling that identifies the first node for your delete item. So with that, you notice how even in this set of test cases, even though they are much shorter than they were in my C-sharp guy, they still end up repeating themselves a lot, right? Who can see the difference between test case number one, line lines 13 through 22, and test case number two, 23 through 26. In fact, if I'm correct, there's exactly one line that is different in the setup. Very good, Josh, that's exactly right. Line 28, container has multiple items changed in value. Now, it took us uh, probably about a minute to find that change, right? Why is it if our test, which ought to be capturing what we really should be seeing as the change, makes it so hard to find the one line that changed? I mean, if I had changed something up, and I'm gonna switch back to my C-sharp example here. If I had changed even one way that the variable, say, executor, was built out in all of this code and then copy paste it to a completely new scenario, it would be very difficult for me to find and see this other means or what changed between these two so I can understand the importance. This is one of the weaknesses of the AAA style because it repeats itself thoroughly with all of the arrangement being repeated at the beginning possibly, it can be very difficult to find the one piece that's changed. And so I would like to present an alternative. And once we have this alternative, I'll really delve into, let's 
seems I lost myself. There we go. Once I've explained this GWT alternative, I would like to expand and continue to talk about through some several examples how you can use given when then testing in your React components to encourage better design for both React as well as Redux components and even just standard JavaScript component, or I'm sorry, function tests. Now, what makes given when then a better way? Well, if you consider that the point of a test is to clarify why the code underneath was written, AAA, which we have already seen, can tend to hide the changes, can become counterproductive. It definitely tests and makes certain that the code functions, but that's one of the lesser things that tests ought to do for us. It may definitely encourage us to talk to our product owners to make certain it meets the business need. But again, it only ends up hiding what those changes were and making it difficult for us to come back and look at it later or to make certain that we actually tested the right thing. And so I will show you an example of what can be done in C Sharp with a given when then format of the same test. So to repeat, the, the tests and the setup you will see in this file are the same as were implemented in this file, but they have been recast from AAA to given when then. Now, given when then, per its name, is composed of three major parts. There is given, which is to say a certain something is assumed or has been set up to be the case. Given I have a count of three, then you may progress to when, which is the evaluation step, when I do something. When I compare the count to the limit, and at that point, you may introduce yourself to seeing, okay, obviously now I've got a count and a limit, and I know both of these are implicit, and then I can say, then I should see that my count is over the limit. And then I have the steps at which I have said what I expect, which corresponds roughly to the arrange portion of arrange act assert when, which corresponds roughly to act, that is to do something when something or some event has occurred, and then, which corresponds to a single uh, assertion from a range act assert. Generally, we like to name these methods with a meaningful name. Now here, given a rule type query is not particularly descriptive, but given that it does not matter as much, it may be ignored. Similar with this executor and product type builder, all of which, if I jump over to my range act assert, this method has a stub but doesn't do anything. This one returns a type delegator configured product, and the executor and builder are both very simple. So all of these may not be that important to the test, but they may be necessary to run. And then I get to this given scenario to match a rule. And that setup is actually very important because it's the piece that I was trying to test earlier. I wanted to have a scenario to test the rule, but Setting up, pardon me, I'm jumping back here. Let's see, this scenario query didn't tell me anything about what was being set up, that there was no scenario match. Now, implicitly, I will have a scenario that matches by rule and a scenario to match it with, as well as the other pieces and some kind of a pricing context. When I go through no scenario matches, I can say when matching these scenarios, which is an empty array, oh, there's literally no scenarios passed in, now, of course, I should have no match returned. This, of course, being the then. If I go to say, let's find a single array, then I have all of these givens up top here. And then I add, given this new scenario to match, given the executor is expected to return true only once, when I match with the scenarios that I just created, then I should expect it to return the scenario that I matched, because it was the one-to-one -one relationship. Now, generally, does everyone agree that the given when then tests are more descriptive? And uh, feel free to jump into the chat on this one. Excellent. So Josh, Kyle, what made them easier to read? What did you notice? What popped out to you? Uh, I mean, for me, it was just uh, more human readable. As you, know, you can see. Yes. Um, you know, given this, given that, when this, then matching should be. Mm -hmm. So that is exactly the benefit that the given when then test style has for us. We, like, 
honestly, if I go and look at method 39, no scenario matches. Okay. Slash method 47 finds a single scenario based upon selection. Okay, that's also pretty clear. But when I go to drill into this, I can very clearly see given those scenarios, given the executor is expected to true at least once, okay, when I match the scenarios I just built, oh, okay, that's very clear exactly what I'm doing. I didn't imply it by, pardon me, jumping over here, constructing my evaluator with that information. That's hidden behind the scenes. I'm telling the user, jumping back, as though it were a story that they were walking through step by step by step, here's how we have come to this point. And now it is very clear what I expect, partly from the test name and partly because I have told you, given you're matching this rather than leaving it to, I barfed a bunch of code on the page and I hope you understand. Now, Kyle, you mentioned that it was much more human readable, right? Uh, yes. Do you think you could show portions of this, maybe not all of it, to your product owner and that they might have a choice of understanding what exactly this thing is doing? Yeah, I, I think not just a product owner, but also another developer in uh, these tests are, are very good documentation for the actual functionality of, of the code. Exactly. And with this code now being written much more like how a human would speak, we can bring in our QAs who don't write JavaScript. We can bring in our PO who doesn't write JavaScript. Heck, we can bring in another developer from the back end who doesn't write JavaScript, or in this case, doesn't write C Sharp, and have them look, us over, look over our code and our tests, as well as the user story, and ask, did I cover everything? And they can meaningfully contribute to the code being written. There have been a couple of clients where I have seen it workable, where the QA actually contributes to writing these unit test cases before the production code is written. That they, in tandem with a developer, sit down together and hash out all of these givens, these whens, these pardon me, evaluations to make certain that we know the code is supposed to work in a certain manner before we get done. Now, let's jump back for a moment, back into JavaScript land. I'm going to go ahead and close both the C sharps. Don't worry, I won't pull out that nasty backend code ever again. So, looking at what I have right now in a range act assert style, it's actually not too bad because my code isn't as dense, but it does definitely leave some stuff to be desired, like how it was hiding this one line change between the two test cases. So, let me show you how this one would look like when it's been refactored into a given when then style. And I'm actually going to try and open these in a left, right, there we go, left and right, so that we can kind of take a look at them side by side. So the first thing I want you to see is that I have pulled out a certain list of givens. So given no product is selected and the container selects only one item, you can then say, okay, so the properties are these things. And when reduced or rendered, here's my render step, and then it should not render. But there are better ways yet to compose all this information. Because you notice what the person who did this refactor has done is he just pulls it out, given no products and multiple have come up. He's getting closer because he's writing it human readable, but he hasn't gotten all the way to separating out the piece that changed, right? So if I give you guys a little bit more room to read this and I ask you to Tell me the, let's see, collapse that. One, two, three, four, five, six. There should be, hopefully, whoop, six words on screen that should immediately grab your attention. What are they? Props, okay. Yeah, props is definitely repeated several times before each, okay. So I'm gonna kind of start collapsing a couple of pieces to help draw your attention to what I'm really interested in you seeing. All right, so looking at then the current 
test set. What words in, say, this line 13 pop out to you? And in particular, I will give product container item. Okay, that's good. I will give away a little bit of a hint, which is they don't follow the normal way we would write a sentence. In fact, they specifically break it. And also thank you, Josh and Kyle and Bosker for continuing to interact with me. I very much appreciate it. So looking at line 13, I would actually like to draw your attention to the word no and only one. You notice how they're written in all caps, yes? This was done with the explicit intention of making sure whoever wrote, read the test case, especially when it was printed out on the console, would be able to see if they were just kind of squinting their eyes and looking at it blurry-eyed, about three patches would come out to them. No and only one which should naturally, as you're reading through this, immediately make you go, wait, hold on, given no what? Or given only one what? Similarly, something has been done like this, render only, only what? Or given a product is selected or invalid. The intent behind the way those test cases were written was to draw attention with the use of the words to what had changed, but they didn't go all the way. Because for example, both of these test cases, line 13 and line 34, involve no product, but the thing that changed was container containing one or multiple items. And so you can drill down deeper. So why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm going to go ahead and start writing a new test file here. So given the item actions bar, given no product is selected, and I'm going to go ahead and create a new given underneath, which is that says the uh, given container contains only one item. Now I can go ahead and copy paste my when and then. When rendered, and I'm going to go ahead and expand this and see, I'm supposed to should not render, should return null because that's basically what I'll be testing. Does everyone understand what the breakdown I just did there, right, it was? Okay, thank you, Josh. So now I just need to pick apart and says, let's see, given no product is selected. Well, I really don't know exactly what that looks like. So let's look at this selected. Ah, it looks like as product has been the thing that changed. So I will likely go ahead when I'm dealing with given no product was selected. I'll go ahead and say let has product. And in fact, yes, we'll have it remain let. Then I will say before each of the test cases. So for those unfamiliar, in jest, we compose our test out of this unit called a describe. And it will take a description and some lambda function that will then go and execute the rest of the test. Very often, we'll use it with a, as a way to contain multiple it statements. So describing something it should do blank is the most basic format, but should look a little bit like this. Describe foo, given a function, it should do bar, which of course will then have a function that would most likely call foo and expect bar as the result. This is essentially the most basic, and that's all we're really doing here, except we are using the way that describe works, being able to nest multiple pieces, to house more detailed information on the test case. Here, we can have it, of course, has product set up each time. In this case, will be false, because now that corresponds one-to-one -one with given no product is selected. When I get to container has only one item, I will likely then say let has multi. All right, let's see, what's the actual property name? Container has multiple items, which 
control C. Let container has multiple items for each container. Container has multiple items is equal to false because it has only one. Now I have a one-to-one -one correlation between this property and the actual scenario that I'm writing and trying to communicate. When I render, I'm just going to go ahead and copy that here. And for the time, I will go ahead. I've made a mistake. Forgive me. We should probably put this render in a before each and, of course, specify let result in this context. Does anyone in attendance have a question about how the context variables inside of describe operate, specifically has product, containers, multiple items, and results? Uh, feel free to jump on the discussion or in the chat to let me know. All right, so I'm going to assume everyone is following along, which actually is very good. So in this particular I think we're good. Excellent. Thank you, boss group. So I'm going to go ahead and set up this set of properties. So we have props being defined as a bunch of stuff we already had, but this time I'm using the has product value and the container has multiple items set up in a simple way for us to immediately render the action bar. Now, if I jump through here, I can tell that I should likely expect result type to be null, given that that's the same test code. So we're just going to grab that and paste it here. And if I collapse this just to the headings, in theory, it should be relatively easy to tell what changed. Because now at a glance, if I just collapse it like this, given no product is selected, I have a variable changing has product. Given container contains only one item, I have a variable changing let container has multiple items changing. When rendered, I get a result, then return null it becomes very descriptive of what actually is changing during all of this. And in particular, as I keep going through this, unfortunately, I don't have the example completely worked out. It actually will show me eventually that this product has valid product is also changing. And so that is now a third different assumption I have made on the data. I will have an invalid, I will have a actual has product, and we'll have also the chance that it has one or multiple items as subcategories under these tests, such that at the end, I would likely have, uh, let's see, invalid, which corresponds to one case. We have valid, valid, which itself then has either product unselected, which itself corresponds to one case, I think. No, I'm sorry, two cases. Sorry. Which is uh, only one item. Sometimes CS code can be too helpful, or many items. And then, of course, we have the last case where product is selected because those are actually the cases I need to deal with. That's four different cases of which one was hidden as the highest level invalid, which didn't get tested until the very end. Ideally, what your test should do that at a glance, when you have all of these minimized, you should be able to see easily what is the biggest driving change at the highest level, which in our case should have been an invalid product or a valid product followed by a selected product or an unselected product, followed by a container item count. However, because the way we had written it originally, we didn't have an easy way to tell, oh, right, I should render all the items when I have an invalid product, or I have only delete when certain, when certain conditions are met. Now, let's go ahead and move on from that, and I'm not gonna go ahead and save those changes. And let's look at other examples of what can be tested in React. Now, this is actually going to be dealing with what is a thunk. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Redux? Hmm. 
little heard of it. Okay. So uh, for those unfamiliar, Redux is a way to share the state of an application with many components without having to pass all of the properties from the highest parent on down. Redux exposes a way for you to share the state across several components so that a component over on the left can be modified and will provide data to the component on the right. It's a very useful layer of abstraction and allows you to write your components in a much, yes, in fact it does, at least underneath, but it provides a nice way to interact with that without you having to go and write all of the listeners and several other things that will keep your data in sync. But you are exactly right that it uses the context underneath. Excellent. So one of the things that can happen when you're interacting with Redux is that you will have a thing called an action. The actions will have a type and a little bit of data called a payload that will allow the reducers, the functions listening for action, to go and update your state. And that's basically the whole flow. But certain extensions on Redux allow you to communicate or execute a long series of synchronous actions underneath what would be called a single action. This example, Thunk, is one such. And in particular, it was used to duplicate a design. But it literally send a call to the server to duplicate all of this information, and then also duplicate it in the front end so we don't have to go get it from the server. And so here is what that code looks like. I'm going to go ahead and take a moment to explain it to you now so we can look at how developing a test from scratch might look, for, well, from the use cases might look. I won't implement all of it. We don't have quite enough time for that this evening. I do wish to be respectful, but we'll get through as much of it as I can. So the first thing that this does is it takes in a new name for that design that we're gonna duplicate. And you'll notice taking in dispatch and get state, which allows me interactions with Redux. I will dispatch a loading event. I'll get some data from the state. I will get the original design that I am about to go and modify. And then I will interact with this API layer to copy the design, and once it's been copied, duplicate the design on the local end, and likely log that event to analytics, update my Redux store, say, hey, I loaded this new item, the one I just copied. I want to make certain the event, all of you know that I updated this count and copies. I want to save that new copy to my account, and then I want to indicate to the user, I have finished this operation and return them to allowing access. Oh, in, a case, in case anything bad happens, go ahead and clear that out so the user can interact with the page. And then, of course, throw the global error warning. Oops, sorry, something went wrong. We'd like you to check on it. Because, of course, everyone needs a good error message. So if I look at this, this is a high-level English description of what all just happened. I have copy design action, given design that can be copied, because if I don't have it, I can't do anything when the user copies that design. Okay, so this is the actual action. The user has called my example func. Then I should convey the loading cycle to the user. Now, this actually means two different actions that I need to verify for. Jumping back to my thunk, that would be both the dispatch of that action and the dispatch of the loaded action. I should perform the copy action. This is the interaction with the API. I should display the newly created copy, which is the dispatch to select that new copy, log the event to analytics, which is the function call. And again, I should copy the counts from the original estimate, that is to update the UI so that all of the displays are nice. All of that was written in English because I can literally tell you, the user should see that they're doing something. I should actually copy it. I should make certain that that copy is automatically selected. I should log that in case we want to analyze it later, and then make certain that the UI has all of the data it needs. All of these are reflected directly in AC. And you can, I hope, see a little bit from what the code was to the AC, which corresponds now to this test case. Does anyone have any questions to how we might go from use case or AC to test cases? Okay, I'm gonna assume we're good and move right along. So this is what it would look like if I finished out the whole of it. It's not a perfect test, but it is a good example. So several things I want to draw your attention to. One, we pulled in the API, we pulled in the thunk, we pulled in several events 
and actions that we wanted to keep track of. And then we mocked several of them. Jest provides us a very nice clean little means to examine the module exported by a particular, uh, what do you call it? By a particular JavaScript file and provide a one-to-one -one Jest function mock for every named export. So if I am dealing with design loaded, well, design loaded is now a mocked module and I may interact with it by telling it to mock it in a particular way or another way. This is very useful in that I don't have to know everything that Design Loaded was doing. I can just say, just not mock this so that when I provide something else, I can either tell it to do a particular action or I can just log, hey, was this thing called? Jest.mock is the way to go. However, if anyone is interested in staying a little bit after, I can explain a shortcoming I found with Jest.mock very recently that interacts with Webpack aliases. That's for another discussion. Jumping right back in. This is how one might look at implementing the very large amount of things that say, given a design that could be tested. We're gonna create a quick little mock state, a bunch of design identification information. We'll provide a mock dispatcher so I can very quickly check, hey, was the dispatch called with this output? I have mocked the API implementation, provided some information to the state, which I'll just collapse, and then I called the thunk. Then we go through and I can say, okay, when the user actually calls the thunk this time, I want to say you should convey the loading cycle, which says I should be able to say the dispatch mock, which I created up right here. I got called a bunch of times. I want to make certain that those calls include loading and loaded, which are both actions. When I perform the copy action, which by the way, I defined right here with a mock implementation, which returns a promise, I can come back down and say, hey, you were called with these two params. This is one of the benefits major of a Jeff function. And so on and so forth. But notice that each it is like three or four lines. And I can say, okay, if should log the event to analytics fails, it has failed for exactly one reason, which on line 81 says that design duplicated was not called. And now I know exactly where in this meandering thing of a thunk was having problems. Oh, let's see. Hmm. Design duplicated was not called, which most likely means that the copy design response from Design Builder API didn't return a promise or something else. And it becomes very quick to diagnose what went wrong because the then statements were succinct and directly to the point. Am I making sense so far? I'm used to a little bit more audience feedback, but I'm doing my best. Fantastic, thank you, Josh, I appreciate it. Now, I told you that the tests work for things in React, which we saw with my example action bar. I said that we could test pieces of Redux, but I would like also to show you how it could be used for just a series of functions. And with this, I'm gonna try and turn us all the way back around to where we started with that example conditional. You guys remember, if stuff is equal equal things, the array is length greater than two, and this flag, but not this other flag. I would like to show you an example of how we went through trying to figure out exactly how this thing runs. Well, if this code was already written and I'm not the one who wrote it and I have to apply tests, I could run the AAA test a little like this. A test for should do the thing, which is given stuff and props and some other stuff, mock out an API, run the complex conditional, and then expect it to be called, which is a little confusing because I haven't really explained why this, flat, this other flag is equal to not this flag or that data is the same as stuff, although that does make sense. Or even why over here, when data is different and this other flag has changed, why it made that happen. Instead, I would recommend trying with this. Given some stuff and a flag, okay, I've got this given. Given that the stuff is invalid, okay, here I have implied a meaning to what this random API call returning with a new thing, that's the same as stuff and this other flag actually means. Now I'm starting to provide some information as I've dug into this and I've asked the business owner, why exactly did we do this? When I've gone and gotten it called, then of course do the thing. 
given the stuff is valid. Okay, now that's a change to just the random API, but, and this is a key thing, I haven't changed what the stuff and this flag happen to be of yet. So things is returning with nothing, and this other flag is false. If I go back and look at my complex conditional, if stuff is, stuff's not gonna be equal empty because I gave it something, this other flag is going to end up being false and therefore not this is true. Okay, so I'm getting closer, but I still haven't covered everything because there's one, two, three, four, five different pieces that could change in some way that might impact whether or not I do the thing. And this is one of the pieces where as you're trying to test your code, you can very suddenly discover places where you need to change your architecture. So having five pieces to test, how many of you would agree that's a little confusing and could get really, really nasty trying to test each and every different variation of this data? Yep. Good, by the way, I did design this one specifically to be confusing. So let me show you what happened as I was looking at this test example. Exactly. I started to try and refactor it. And so what I realized is that there are actually two things that could trigger do the thing. If you go back and look at the complex conditional, there is an or statement right here. And while I was testing this, I realized that stuff and things had no relationship to this array, this other flag, and that other flag. Because honestly, this flag looks like it's just saying, should I do the thing or not do the thing, what, no matter what happens between stuff and thing. Hmm, okay. So let's separate that then. The stuff did not change was the first thing. That's what, sorry, sorry the first conditional check. It says, oops, wrong, wrong page. It says that stuff and things are equivalent. So I just put that in English and said, stuff did not change. And I extracted that to a function that I could test independently. And now I can simply say, if that thing returns true, whatever that conditional evaluation actually is, I should do the thing. Further, I go ahead and I take a look. I have too many uniques, which I extrapolated from array.length is greater than two to mean, because there's something that changed that made that value unique, okay? I failed to validate. So this is what I named the, thing, the function that dealt with this flag and this other flag. Should validate, but failed, because it appears that this flag is a response from the random API on whether or not you succeeded in validating. And this would be the control for I should be validating in the first place, regardless of what the API did. So I said should validate, but failed as a com combination of those. And should do the thing anyway comes from too many unique and I failed to validate. Because if I shouldn't have validated and I failed, I don't care. But if I didn't, I want to do the piece. And then of course I have it called do the thing. Now, key thing, this function is actually longer. I wrote more code to support this. But it's easier to see why I ought to do the thing, right? I either do it because my stuff didn't change when I sent it to the server, for whatever reason, or perhaps I had too many unique and I failed to validate the condition. If I look at my tests, you can see I imported those same helper functions and I mocked all of them, all at once. And when I do this, and I'm gonna go ahead and try and collapse as much of this as I can so that it's easy to see really quickly what I'm doing. I don't think I did all of the tests on this, but I got close. Oh, actually, maybe I did. So given the complex condition, given stuff did change, given fewer needs than expected, given the validation succeeded, when I called, do not do the thing. That's one set of many that I had to check. Given the validation failed, well, still do not do the thing because stuff did change. Or because some other condition was missing. But now I'm able to start gathering more and more each time I dig down to make certain I didn't miss a case. For example, if I had too many uniques and stuff did change, then the validation succeeded. Well, I'm not going to do the thing because the validation succeeded. But Given the validation failed, now I do the thing. And I'm able to start pulling out this very complex conditional into smaller manageable chunks because I'm changing one variable at a time during each step downward in the given. 
Now, I believe that has me running up right on time. So it is my hope that this has shown you some of how we might get better designs out of our code, that as we're testing it and we start noticing, hey, this is really tough to test and really, really hard to describe why, it encourages us to go back and think about how that test was structured so as to encourage us to A, pull out smaller test releases and B, describe in our code with say the variable names like we did for this refactor where I said too many unique or fail to validate so that as I'm looking at it, I can actually understand what the code thought it was doing, even if the test can't tell me yet. And so I thank you all very much for your time. I would welcome any feedback you have. This is a nice little QR code, which will send you to a uh, survey sheet if you guys are willing to have the time. But before I get too far from that, I would like to open the floor to any questions. Feel free to jump on the phone. I would be happy to talk with you. Uh, thanks, Daniel, uh, for doing the talk. Uh, if anyone is having any questions, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, Daniel. And I will provide an email address at the end of the presentation if anyone thinks of a question, say, tomorrow and you would like me to answer it. I'd be more than happy to help. I guess a, a question I would have is, um, you know, you showed a lot of uh, React unit testing, mm -hmm. uh, but have you, um, do you ever find yourself doing any integration testing, whether it, whether it be with, with um, uh, Enzyme and Jest or using something like Cypress? So I will admit I haven't used Cypress, but I have on occasion dealt with integration tests in Jest. It is not my preferred way to do it, as it does usually mean I was unable to separate some important piece Normally, and I'm going to jump back to code here real quick, if you will look with me at the example action bar, I like to use this one as an example of my preferred style for a component. And the reason I'm bringing this up is normally when I run into integration tests for Jest, it's across um, multiple components and how the child ends up interacting based upon changes in the parent. If I have it such that the child changes the data in the parent, usually I have something more complex than I like to deal with because that two-way structure ends up indicating there's going to be a lot of chatting back and forth. Very often my preference is to separate that out into Redux. Here, what I have done is made it so that each of the actions that the example action bar might have run at one point in time has been extracted away so that the one piece at a time deals with that uh, one component at a time deals with one action that I might be dispatching. And one other component, the bar itself, can choose, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> can choose what actions to make available to the user. Notice all the, all of the evaluations for whether or not to show the edit item don't belong to edit item. All edit item has to know is I'm here, when someone clicks on me, I go do this thing. And that's very easy to test. Separately, the example actions bar is the one who just decides, do I show this or do I not? And that's all he does. He doesn't actually do things, which makes him easy to test. And usually if I'm running into integration tests, this is the kind of thing I look to start doing, to peel apart the layers. Now that said, it's not always possible to pull aside layers like that. And it becomes important, especially in things like, say, the thunk, to find ways to test pieces that matter. There may be ways that I cannot test, say, that the copy design worked exactly, but I can trust the back end guys to have handled that, where this becomes an integration point. But if they're having trouble testing, I could remove the mocking from this copy design and run real tests with my command line rather than running them in the UI. Does that make sense, uh, Kyle? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, so Neil, you were asking for more specifics to web GUI considerations. Would you elaborate a little bit more what you're asking for?
I think uh, they were uh, kindly looking uh, into things uh, from a front end perspective. Hmm. So if I'm correct in interpreting that, or sorry, Basu, were you asking a separate question or were you elaborating for Neil? No, I was thinking Neil might be asking this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe relationships to MVC I'm hearing, is that correct? Or were you thinking a minimum viable product? I'm trying to make certain I interpret your uh, acronym correctly. Okay, MVP, got it, model view presenter. So the unit test in this particular case can escape some of the considerations for model view presenter in that the view, well, okay, some, in that the unit test itself is only dealing with one piece out of those three. If, for example, I am dealing with, say, a reducer, which usually is just a simple function about like that, I can deal with it just as a function without having to consider its place in the wider whole because I can control entirely what it knows it's interacting with. But in the case of, for, of the example actions bar, ideally I can constrain my interactions to just the props. Item ID has a product, invalid, has multiple items and can modify items. By doing that, I can pull out, at least from a testing perspective, what piece I'm dealing with because I can treat it just like another function, which in this case, a React component is just a function that returns HTML. But if I take it from the design perspective, so stepping out from unit testing, and I talk talking about model view presenter design constraints, I find very often that testing helps me indicate where I need to make a new break. As I was talking with Kyle, he asked, so how do I deal with integration tests for Jeff? I found that if I'm starting to do an integration where I'm digging too deep, too many layers down in the code, I usually need to find some way to mock and break that off so that I can test the piece that I'm interested in separately. If I'm truly interested that a call got made, then I need to write a test that says the call got made, not that when this button was pressed, a call got made. That allows me to pull back and say, when I'm in the presenter, presenter that is the, how do you call it, the button, when the user has interacted with that, that click event, I can mock the click event and then watch that my component has tied the click event to something I told it to do. Then when I get down to the view, I can deal with, okay, given this data, you should render this. And again, test it like it was an HTML function. And then when I get down to the model that says, hey, when someone calls this function on you, change your data this way, and they test it like it is a regular uh, code component and say, given this setup, when you change like this, I expect these new property values. Does that help answer some of your questions? Very good. All right, so if there are no other questions, I would greatly value any feedback you have. This is the first time I have done a remote presentation of this kind, and I thank you very much, Foster, for the opportunity. I would welcome any feedback you guys have so that I can continue to get better at doing this. And I thank you very much for spending your time this evening with me. Uh, Sarah, the uh, hope was that I might be able to share it. I admit I'm a little embarrassed. I don't know how well I did. But uh, Bosker, I'm assuming that JavaScript and Friends has a website where we might be able to share that with? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I will be uploading this to our uh, LinkedIn and Twitter feeds. Uh, we will also plan to upload it to our YouTube channel so that uh, it will be available there. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing myself on YouTube. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not certain. <laughs> sure, sure. So I did mention that I would share an email address with everybody. You may go ahead and find me at daniel at .io or daniel.scheifler at improving.com. I have both of those and tend to check them daily. So I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions that you had. Thank you very much for your encouragement, Sarah, and all of you guys for keeping up with me. And if you guys happen to be interested in any additional content, I do write a blog on about a weekly basis. 
uh, feel free to drop by daniel.scheifler.io and see if any content interests you. And if any of it happens to interest you, feel free to let Bosker know and he can come hound me and I'd be happy to come talk to you guys about it. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for doing today's talk. And uh, thank you all for attending uh, our first uh, online meetup for React. Uh, feel free to let us know like if you have any feedback or any other topics which you like us to conduct uh, we will plan to conduct future remote meetups as well and uh, thank you everyone for uh, spending time with us and uh, thank you all Thank you very much, Bosker, for all of the help you gave today. Made this go much easier. Uh, sure, Daniel. Thank you.